Okay, welcome back. This is going to be part two of the last Maria abbreviated teach video where we're going to go over all of the concepts, the little minor concepts that we didn't talk about in the main overall teach. Uh, this will give you a more comprehensive view if you watch part one and part two together. You should know everything you need to know um, to play Maria without somebody having to teach you. Okay, so let's talk about <clears throat> stacking generals as our first thing we're going to go over. Okay, so if you remember from the first video, well, when you move, you can move uh, a general up to three spaces, one, two, three, or if he's on a main road, he can move up to four spaces, right? But I also mentioned that you cannot move through any other pieces other than an enemy supply train. Now, that's not 100% true, because as you'll notice uh, on the board at the start of the game, there are a couple of generals that are stacked on top of each other. So how did they become stacked on top of each other? Well, um, the way it works is you are allowed to stack at most two generals of the same power or a cooperating power together. Uh, and the way it works is like this. Let's say it is Austria's turn and they're moving with general number three and he wants to move this way, okay? He can move one, and then two of his movement to stack on top of a general of his own power that's in his way or that he wants to become stacked with. Once he does this, uh, the general of the lower value goes on top. So even if it was this way and he moved like that, you'd still put number three on top. Okay. At most, it can only be two. And then the movement for both generals ends immediately, even if this general hadn't moved yet. So one, two, he doesn't get to take and do the rest of his movement, three, four, right? He stops going two, and number four, that general also ends his movement. Boom, done. On their next movement, Austria's next movement, they could either unstack them and just move them again, one, two, three, and then this guy is free to move wherever he wants, or they can now move together as a stack, as if it was one general. So it can still force march up to eight, move four on the main road, three on an off main road, okay? Why would you want to stack your generals? Well, the reason is because the armies of the generals combine. So let's look at, we have uh, generals three and four here combined. So that's six and two. So they start with eight generals or armies instead of just six or two, right? Uh, so then... Uh, on the future turn, they could come in here one, two, and now when they're battling this Bavaria France stack, which I'll explain how that works in a second, they now fight with eight armies. Okay. So again, you can always stack at most two generals from a power that you control, like Austria could stack their generals, uh, Prussia could stack their generals, Pragmatic Army could stack their generals, and France could stack their generals. Or you can stack if you're cooperating like France and Bavaria are cooperating powers, so they can stack. At the beginning of the game, Prussia and Saxony are cooperating powers, so they can stack. And throughout the game, um, the Pragmatic Army and Austria over here are cooperating powers and can stack if they agree. So how does it work if you're stacking um, cooperating powers? It's the same thing as a regular one. So when you stack, the lower number uh, goes on top. And you still need to check supply for both of the generals in this stack to both of their supply trains, okay? So this uh, Bavarian general being on top is considered the, he's like the supreme commander of this stack. But it does not absolve the French, the French army below from tracing supply, okay? Um, so why do you stack the lower disc on top? What does that matter? Well, that becomes, like I said, like the ultimate general in charge. And all that means is um, in a situation like this where there are two cooperating powers stacked up, when this army, this collective group fights, it fights with whoever's on top's hand. So in this instance, Bavaria's cards are used in the, in the battle and... France, well, there were if there were France cards over here, there should be. They're not used. So this stack is fighting with both armies combined, both the Bavarian army of one and the French army of three. So their armies combined, but they're using only the hand of the Bavarian general. 
Okay, so that is a situation that you may want to happen. Now, another thing you can do in a stacked army of only one power, you can't do it in this army because there's two powers, is you can freely share armies between the two. So let's consider uh, this one here, three and four, right? We looked at this, three and four is uh, these two guys right here. And army three has six, army four has two. While they're stacked up, you can freely share them. Let's say I wanted to split this stack up. But before I do that, I want, let's say, why don't I remove four uh, or three armies from here and add three armies from here. I could do this. Okay, so now when they move, now this guy, if he wants to go stack with him, he could. Now it's three and five. Now um, they have four and this little guy still has five, right? It's a possibility. You can freely share armies, provided you do not go over the max of eight and under the minimum of one. Every general must have at least one army to stay on the board and can have no more than eight. So that means in a stacked, gen a stacked, uh, a stack will at minimum have two armies and at most have 16. Okay, can never have less than that or more than that. Um, let's say for the sake of argument that it was number three and five were stacked up and they lost some some people they lost two two armies you can never kill one if you can take some from another so three and five together have a base strength of four if they lost two you'd have to take the two from here bringing the total to one and one okay um that's it for stack generals again they can always at the beginning of their turn they can unstack, okay? But they can't, you can't say, I'm gonna move this stack, one, two, three, four, and now I'm gonna split off the other guy and move him, one, two, three, four. You can't do that. You have to make the decision at the beginning of your turn. Do I wanna leave them stacked or do I want to unstack them? If you unstack them, they get their both, both of their movements, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, right? You could do that. Um, but if not, if you're not unstacking them, you have to move them as a stack and then you don't get to decide until the next turn whether you want to unstack them again. Okay, that is stacking generals. Let's now talk about the next phase, which is retroactive conquests. Now, we should have talked about this last video, but I just forgot to mention it. Um, retroactive conquests, I did talk about it, but I didn't actually say that's what this is. So let's just go into more detail about exactly what retroactive conquests are. If you remember our example um, from the last video, we had a battle between this general and this general, okay? And it was over this spot, okay? And the Austrian general lost by one. And so the Prussian guy pushed him back one space. But you're, if you remember, after that happens, we now do what's called retroactive conquest. So I said, if you remember, you shouldn't because I didn't actually explain it. But what this means is after a battle is resolved, you then do retroactive conquests, which means you evaluate any potential victory points that were in flux before the battle started, like this victory point marker right here. It was a question mark because, you remember, this Austrian general was, with, was, was within three spaces, so it protected it. If Prussia had moved Austria more than one space away, or let's say three spaces away, now this fortress is more than three spaces away from this general, so it would flip over that conquest retroactively would give him the point. However, in our example, it only lost by one, which means it was pushed back either here or here. Both instances are three spaces away. So this retroactive conquest is taken away. Okay, that's all retroactive conquests is, are. It's just after the combat phase, you look on the board to see any of victory point markers that are in flux and you just evaluate them. It's that simple. Uh, let's now talk about the. there's a, a little power that each major power has. And we're talking about Prussia's first. Prussia has something called uh, offering peace to Austria. You can see there's this area here of the board. This is Silesia. At the very beginning of the game, all of these victory point markers are Austrian controlled. And so at the very beginning of the game, Austria is very close to winning. And so Prussia is trying to seize control of all of these uh, fortresses. 
to get their victory point markers on the board and push Austria back. And they're poised to do that right, at the, right off the gate. So when you're the Prussian player, one of the first things you want to do probably is take over Silesia as fast as you can. So again, to beat back the Austrian offense. Once, at any point during the game, Prussia has control of every Silesian fortress, as you can see they do in this example. At the end of any of their turns going forward, they can offer peace to Austria. As soon as Austria accepts peace, and only when they accept peace, um, then a number of things happen. So the first thing that happens is Silesia is now considered to be Prussian home territory. And that's going to matter in a minute when I get into the winter phase. And we'll talk about that as we get there. Um, if Saxony was a Prussian ally at this point, they now immediately become neutral. And we haven't talked about neutrality, but I'll do that now. All that happens when you're neutral is nobody can attack you. You can't attack anybody else. Nobody can move through your country. And you can't even trace supply or anything through your country. Okay, so you're basically just off the map for a while. So Saxony becomes neutral as soon as Austria accepts peace from Prussia. So if Saxony was Prussian controlled, now they're not. And they're neutral and they won't be ever Prussian controlled again for the rest of the game. Okay. Um, any Austrian victory point markers that happen to be in Prussia um, are returned to the Austrian pool. And half of the victory point markers rounded up um, from Prussia in Austria are returned. Actually, I think ha actually half rounded up are set aside. The rest are returned to Prussia's pool. Okay. Um, if there's pieces from Austria in Prussia, they have to vacate. And same, if there's pieces of from Prussia in Austria, they have to vacate back like here. Okay, they have to get out because you know we're offering peace now, so we're gonna not we're gonna be neutral. Uh, Prussia gets a victory point marker in this box here, which is the Silesian box, and this was here. They also get their second supply train that comes out into the board, which is great. Um, and like I said, Pr like I said, Saxony is neutral. Prussia now is also neutral until the action stage after next. So almost like two turns, Prussia is also saying, okay, I'm neutral. As soon as any Prussian peace leaves Prussia and comes into offensively attacking Austria, those victory point markers that were set aside are returned back to their pool. So why would Prussia want to ever offer peace to Austria. And the reason is what I talked about a little bit in the first video, how France, Bavaria, Prussia, and Saxony are allies against Austria, but they're not teammates, okay? Let's say the the French player is coming into Austria on the Western Front and taking over all of these fortresses. And they're getting all these victory point markers out and they're about to, you know, potentially win. And Austria is splitting up their, their forces fighting French, France over here and Prussia over here. Prussia might say, okay, we got to do something here to stop France. Let's let's have peace, you and me. You can then focus all of your efforts, Austria, on attacking and beating back France. I will sit back, collect a bunch of cards for two rounds, not fighting you. You know, um, I still have control over Silesia. Silesia is mine. I get a victory point for doing it. I get my second supply train as well. And you kind of work on buffing up a little bit and stopping France. So that might really help the Prussian player. Also, don't forget, the Prussian player controls the pragmatic army. So now, if Russia is not Russia, if Austria is not fighting Prussia over here and draining cards, um, they have cards to help the pragmatic army on this side fight France. So I feel like, and I don't know this for a fact because I haven't played this a ton, but it does seem like offering peace is a way to stop the French advancement against uh, the other two players, okay? Because it's not also great for Prussia because Prussia loses any victory point markers they had in Austria. They lose Saxony, which could be big. And they can't do anything or an attack for a couple rounds. And if they do, all those victory point markers they had in, in Austria go back to their pool. Um, so it's you got to really figure out when you want to do that, okay? So that is what ha that's the offering piece that the Prussian player and only the Prussian player can do. Um, France has a similar one and it is called 
um, France reducing military objectives. Let's say the French player has a bunch of, like we talked about, a bunch of victory point markers out here in Austria. Okay. There we go. They have all of this out here. And they take their French army and they move it back into Bavaria. As soon as the French player has no generals inside of Austria, and this only happens on the Bohemia map, no French generals inside of Austria, they can, at the end of their turn, declare that they are reducing military objectives. And what that means is they are removing all of their victory point markers that are in Austria. Okay. Half of them rounded up, in this case, three, stay off the board. Okay, permanently. And the rest go back to their pool. You might be thinking, why the heck would they want to do that? They had them out on their pool. Well, three of them are permanently off the board. Um, you know, when they're on the board, they can just be recaptured. But when they're off, they can't. So these are permanently out of their pool, right? Um, and I think it's a similar situation. If Prussia is advancing a lot and taking away a lot of um, fortresses in Austria, maybe France is like, you know what? I'll take some of mine off the board, let you focus on Prussia, and I'll focus over here on this board. You know, maybe I'm up here taking stuff away from from these, and I'm doing okay. I don't need this. I don't need all. I don't need to fight over here right now. Okay, so that's what happens if France declares reduces military objectives. I think when France comes back onto the map, though, I think it's a similar situation as Prussia. I think they have to give these back to their pool. Um, so that is, um, it's not, it's not if they come onto the map, it's if they con reconquer a fortress, then they have to go back into their pool. Okay. So they're basically kind of saying like, all right, look, I got enough victory point markers over there. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to concentrate over here on this map on this side. You do you. And now nobody, you know, these victory point markers are permanently out of their pool and cannot be retaken by Austria. Okay, that's like France's power. And Austria's power is this, just related to this general on this map over here. This general, Ehrenberg, is always considered to be in supply in the Netherlands, in the Pragmatic Armies area. So he's always in supply here. And also, he when he's not in here or in Austria home territory, he can also trace his supply to the Pragmatic Army's supply train. Because remember, Pragmatic Army and Austria are cooperating powers over here. Okay, So even if this supply train is like way over here, this guy is still in supply because he's six away from this supply train. And if he's right here, he's in supply, even though this guy is way over here and he's not in Austria. Okay, That's um, the Austrian guys kind of power okay um so now we should talk about the electoral college and the imperial election uh this is another way to get victory points for all three of the powers in at some point in the second year so some point between turns four five and six we're going to draw this card this is the Imperial Election card. It gets set aside, and at the end of the round, it triggers. And what this means is, if you look at the board, any board space that has this little castle thing on it, uh, there's one here, that yellow castle thing, one here, one here, and all of these spaces, okay? These spaces are these um, nine spaces on the board, okay? To win the imperial election, a power needs to have five votes made up from this imperial, this electoral college. Okay, you can see at the beginning of the game, Austria and the Pragmatic Army have four. French, I keep saying this the wrong way. France has three. Prussia has one. Saxony is supposed to have one. This should be green. Okay, those are all the people that have votes. A vote. Uh, a marker of Pragmatic Army in Austria will always vote for Austria. A France marker will always vote for France. And those are the only two powers that can win the election. Either Austria wins it or France wins it. So one of those two will get a victory point. Okay. Um, 
So when the election happens, these four votes will be cast for Austria. These three votes will be cast for France, and these two can swing either way, and you just need five votes. So if Saxony is controlled by Prussia, the Prussian player will get to determine who wins the election. You might think, why would they want either of them to win? And that, again, is there's three of us, and so whoever's kind of winning at the time is going to probably get the votes from Prussia, right? If France has most of their victory point markers on the board, then Prussia's going to vote for Austria, let Austria get that point, and vice versa. Um, now, you might also be wondering, why are these split between um, Austria and the Pragmatic Army? Well, there is a way the Pragmatic Army can also get a point here, which again is, you know, played by the Prussian player. So you can see there's this like neutral zone of the map that we don't ever talk about. It's not controlled by any one power, so you can't actually conquer fortresses in it. But you will see there's four of these, these electoral college markers at the beginning of the game on the board. And as soon as a general moves through one, just as if it was conquering a city, right? So one, two, three, this would change from the current power because Pragmatic Army went through it to the Pragmatic Army. And that's the city of Köln. So then you'd also change it down here. Boom, that does a couple things. As soon as there are three of the four of these for one side, that player gets a victory point. Now, remember I said the winner of the election, if it's Austria and the Pragmatic Army, Austria gets the point, which would go here. But if ever there are three of the same of the four of these, Pragmatic Army gets the victory point. So even so, if this situation were to happen during the election, Pragmatic Army gets the victory point for having three of the four of them, but Austria gets the victory point for, ha for winning the election because there's five votes there. And so that's how that would work. Uh, likewise, if this, so this was, oops, this was France. Likewise, if the French player controls one of these cities, that's Maine, Maine Falls, um, like that. Now France has three of the four of them, and France would then get the victory point for here. And that can go back and forth. Right. It's just if and if this was the situation at the elect at the time of the election, France now has four votes. Uh, Austria Pragmatic Army has three, and it would come down to Saxony and Prussia to determine the winner. So now, if Saxony defects and becomes neutral, that is now controlled by the Austrian player. So if this this vote is supposed to be green, this would likely be a vote for Austria. So that is the. Um, Electoral College and the Imperial Election, how that works. Anytime one of these cities is taken over, uh, let's say Austria takes over this city and gets a victory point marker for it, they would also get one of their uh, Electoral College markers on there. Anytime one of these ones is taken over. So this is a key city. This is a key city. This is a key city. Right? So it's a big deal. Um, it's only like one point or something, but it's a big deal. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the Hussars phase. We just never even talked about it because it's very simple um, and it's very quick and it only affects the Austrian impacts, the Austrian player. So here's how it works. So the first thing is we all we, we draw uh, or we do the politics phase. That's the very first thing we do. And then after that, the Austrian player puts out Hussars. What are Hussars? There are two markers that Austria has on the board or off the board in their supply. These are the Hussars markers. They have a four on them because you must place them four spaces away from a general on the Bohemia map of Austria. Austria is never allowed to place Hussars by this guy on the Flanders map, only on the, uh, the Bohemia map. Um, four away from this, 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 or this, okay? And what is the purpose for these things? These are trying to block supply from enemy generals. So consider this. Um, this general, one, two, three, four, five, six, is currently in supply from this supply train. But on my Hussars phase, I might take this Hussar and place it there. It's four spaces away from this general. And now that I've put it there, remember, you can't place, you cannot trace supply through enemy pieces. So now 
the Prussian general has to try to trace supply. One, two, three, or oops, one, two, three, four. Wait, wait. One, two, three, four. Oh, it can't. It blocks. This guy blocks his supply. Can he get there anywhere else? One, two, three, four, five, six. No. One, two, three, four, five. Nope. So this Hussar blocks his supply. Now I got one Hussar left. I could also use it. Oh, I think I had a situation like this. I could go one, two, boom. That's four spaces away from this guy. You can trace that through him. One, two, three. Now this Hussar blocks both of these, I think. Right? You can't get to their supply trains because this guy blocks it. So that's bad. So what does that mean? Um, it does not knock the general out of supply, as we talked about in the supply phase of the first video. All it does is you it makes the, the player who's tracing supply have to pay in points of cards. Um, the supply number amount that you would trace it through. Well, so what does that mean? The smallest number to get into supply through the Hussar is how much they have to pay. So this guy being here, the shortest route to be in supply is one, two, three, four, five, six through this. So that means the Prussian player has to pay six points worth of cards. Doesn't matter the suit in order to, to, to stay in supply. It's like a little tax you're paying. So they'd take the six, they'd pay it to the supply. You don't pay it to Austria, you pay it to the supply. And now everything's fine and they're good. Same way over here, though. The Bavarian player and the French player must pay, let's see, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five. Right? So points in cards, they got to pay, if, like the Bavarian player has to pay four. Oh, they only have a three, seven, five, and nine. They got to pay the five. And so now they're in supply and everything's fine. Um, this piece does not block movement as other pieces i've said do so as soon as an enemy piece so after the hussar phase ends and you pay your you pay or don't pay um that's all the hussars do so if this general wants to move in here it just kills it even a supply train would one two would knock a hussar off the board you they don't block enemy movement they don't fight they will never engage in combat they're literally just a piece that's out there to harass the Prussian and French players, if you're Austria, by just siphoning some cards out of their hand, okay? Because as Austria, you have one hand to fight everybody. So if you can figure out clever ways using these Hussars to pull out cards from your opponents, that's pretty awesome, okay? So that's the Hussars phase. At the beginning of the next Hussars phase, if they got knocked off the board, they just come back on. If no one touched them, they'll just stay there, and then the Austrian player can move them however they want to, okay? So that's all the Hussars do. They just harass the other players. Um, the next is subsidy contracts. So those are these little S tokens here. So in this game, you can negotiate and you can negotiate pretty much anything you want to. And every negotiation that you do, if someone accepts your negotiation, it's binding. So if I say to you, hey, I won't attack you for a couple turns if you don't take over this city right now. I'll attack you. I won't attack you for two whole turns. If we agree on that, because you can, it's binding and I can't go back on that. You know, another example of something you might say is, hey, you know, um, look, the, the election's really close. If you, as the Prussian player, vote for Austria to get that victory point, I'll let you walk in and take, or I'll let you, you know, uh, take the last Silesian fortress and I won't bother you. But you got to vote for me in the election. So I get that. I'm giving you a point. You got to give me a point. You know, you can do stuff like that. And if you say yes, you have to do it. You can't uh, go back on that. However, if you ever want to negotiate for cards, like I'll give you a card and you can use against them, you can, but you have to use uh, a subsidy contract token. So subsidy contracts, think of it as a negotiation like anything else you can do, but it only is for cards and it has to work a certain way. So the way it works is... Only allied powers can do this. So Austria can never do this with France and Austria can never do this with Prussia, but Austria can do it with the pragmatic army and Prussia and France can do this together. And it is basically giving up one card of income to the person you're giving the subsidy contract to. That's all it is. So let's say I'm Austria and pragmatic army is like, I don't have a, enough cards to fight France over here. I need something. 
and Austria is like, well, I get a bunch of cars. I don't need a, a ton. I'll give you a subsidy contract for two turns. And you have to give them two tokens. You can do as many turns as you want. For two turns, I'll give you one of my cards of income into your hand. And that's a subsidy contract. It's that simple. So then when it's the nether, uh, the uh, Pragmatic Army's and Austria's turn, instead of the Austrian player drawing five cards, they'd draw four. And instead of the Pragmatic Army drawing three, they'd draw four. And you just knock these markers away as the turns are taken up, right? So the first time they get the, they get one card, they put that back. Second time they get one card, they put that back. And then the subsidy contract ends, unless they want to make another one. There's a forced subsidy contract at the beginning of the game between France and Bavaria. France draws four cards during income for the first four turns of the game. Bavaria draws two. Starting on the fifth turn of the game, France now draws five cards. Bavaria draws one. So there's a four car, a four turn subsidy contract between France and Bavaria that happens at the very beginning of the game for four turns. So that's it. That's how subsidy contracts work. It's very, very simple. So now let's talk about the winter phase and reinforcements. That is down here. Um, and it happens every fourth turn, okay? So the game is split into four years, right? The first three turns work the same way with um, politics, Hussars, France, Bavaria, Prussia, Saxony, Austria, and Pragmatic Army. And on the fourth turn, we go to winter, which has two different distinct things that you do. It's basically like a cleanup phase. It's recruitment and winter scoring. Remember, the game ends as soon as one player empties their pool of victory points. Or, if that doesn't happen, it ends at the end of the fourth year in the winter phase, at the end of round 12. And the way you determine a winner is uh, the way I'm about to tell you. So, in the winter, you first add up the, the victory point markers that are left remaining in each person's pool and write those down. So, Austria has four, Pragmatic or Prussia has seven, Pragmatic Army has eight, France has six, okay, for a sake of argument. We just write those numbers down. We do that again in the next winter phase, again in the next winter phase, and again in the fourth winter phase, and then we add all those up. Whoever has the lowest number becomes is the winner of the game, okay? So the other thing you do in winter is you can recruit. Throughout the, the rounds, you're going to be uh, having combat, and so you're going to be losing armies. And sometimes you might even lose generals off the board. And so this is the last thing you can use your cards for. For four points of cards... So this card here is has two points, right? Because it's four and four is eight. We can't get to another four. You can recruit one army for every four points of tactics cards. So if I got rid of this 10, I could recruit two armies to anyone I want to in my of my generals. Okay, to a max of eight, can never have more than eight. If a general has been knocked off the board, it's the same thing. You recruit them. Like I could spend these two recruitment points. I could, let's say I put them both in here. And then this guy gets to go back onto the board. This is the reason for these major fortresses. This is where you put guys that were previously dead back onto the board. I could pick this spot, this spot, this spot, or this spot. Okay. Once Silesia is annexed, then this space becomes a spot that Prussia can uh, get back onto the board. Okay. Now, it works the same way for supply trains. Supply trains cost four points in tactics cards, and you can bring them back onto the board now, but you can also bring them back onto the board during your current movement phase of any turn you're in. So if a supply train gets gobbled up and knocked off the board, once it's your movement phase, you can spend four points in tactics cards to bring them back. Um, but the generals, you have to wait until the winter phase if they die. And then so you can spend as many tactic cards as points in tactic cards as you want to have as many armies as you want, again, to a max of eight per army. And that is winter phase and reinforcements. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about conserving politics cards. So we talked in the politics phase last video. Uh, when you reveal your cards, the person who is first in first place is going to resolve one of these cards. Um, but let's say they didn't want to. Let's say it's Austria's turn and he gets to pick one of these two cards. But he's like, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'm going to defer to the next highest player. And because I deferred, I get to keep this card here for the next politics phase. And so he will just stay there. And then the suit won't matter in the next politics phase. And any card that gets added on the next phase gets added to that number. So now it's instead of eight or instead of six, it's 14. 
Okay. Um, and then it would be the precious player, precious turn to e evaluate one of these cards. And he could do the same thing. I don't want to. I'm going to leave that there. And then this guy could choose one, discard it, right? Um, so then these cards, again, would this one will go away. These ones would stay out. And then in the next politics phase, you could do the same thing. Say it's spades again. All right, I have 14, but it's like, okay, I don't want either of these. I'm going to defer again. Now both of these get to stay out for the next politics phase. So you can really help yourself in future politics phases by doing that. Okay, you can also bluff. I don't know if we talked about that. You're allowed to bluff and put any card you want down during the politics phase, just so the other players may be like, oh, what is he playing? I got to play something higher. And then when it flips over, it's like, ha ha, it's not even the right suit. And then it just goes back into their hand. Okay, so that's pretty much everything else. Uh, if you watch video one, that will give you a very general overview. If you watch this video in companion uh, with video one, you should literally know everything you need to about how to play a uh, game of Maria. So thanks for watching and I uh, hope this was informative.